We all know that conflicts can arise in any workplace, and if left unaddressed, they can quickly escalate, damaging not only individual relationships, but also the productivity and success of a team or organization. Conflict isn't always negative. It can be an opportunity for growth and positive change when it's managed effectively. One very public example of relational workplace conflict is the highly publicized feud between former co-hosts of a popular morning show, Matt Lauer and Ann Curry. In 2012, Ann Curry was unexpectedly ousted from her position as co-host, and rumors circulated that, that Lauer played a significant role in her departure. Following Ann Curry's departure, there were numerous reports of tension and strained relationships between her and Lauer. The media outlets covered this conflict extensively, and it became a prominent topic of discussion within the industry. Now, this situation highlighted the challenges of workplace dynamics, power imbalances, and the potential for personal conflicts to impact professional relationships in any setting. The fallout from this conflict had a lasting impact on both Lauer and Curry's careers. Lauer was fired in 2017, mind you, five years later, following allegations of sexual misconduct, about which Ann Curry had previously warned the network. Now, that is a loaded example. And as we'll learn from today's host, in a professional setting with clear and established communication, protocols for conflict management and resolution, and of course, a healthy workplace culture, delicate situations can be discussed, addressed, and handled in a swift and effective manner. Tune in to learn more. So here's a question for you. Would you benefit from ongoing support to improve your bottom line and ultimately help you master the business of practice ownership? Tracy Trepesky International offers you a proven, impeccably designed method to scale your practice while preserving your most precious assets, your time and energy. We blend business consulting with executive leadership to bring you what you need most to help you become an agile, entrepreneurial CEO while serving your patients with the utmost attention to their care. You receive individualized coaching and support from me and our professional team, providing the best of business consulting and executive leadership coaching to grow your practice without working more. Schedule your complimentary 45-minute strategy call at tracytrapesky.com. Welcome to Thriving Practice. I'm your host, Tracy Trapesky, and I can't wait to introduce you to our incredible guests and to share business tips and strategies that will help make your life easier and support you in becoming the exquisitely fulfilled CEO you're meant to be. I am on a mission to help practice owners take back one day per week for the rest of their careers so they can focus on healing their patients and maximizing their profits. No more sacrificing your personal life or feeling burnt out. It's time to take back control and create the practice of your dreams. Whether you're a seasoned provider or just starting out, this podcast is your go-to resource for actionable advice and inspiration. Together, we'll uncover the hidden potentials within your practice and propel you towards the success and freedom you crave. So if you're ready to transform your practice, make a lasting impact and reclaim that one day per week for yourself, then you're in the right place. Let's embark on this journey together. Carol, it is so good to have you on the show. Thank you so much for coming. It is a pleasure to be here. I'm so looking forward to our conversation. Me too. And based on, you know, our little warm up and a couple of minutes ago, I'm my my wheels are turning, so I will do my best to stay really focused on the things that I think that our listeners will really appreciate. But I'm really excited to dive into this conversation. Me too. Yeah. So before we dive in, tell us where you are in the world. I am located in Tacoma, Washington, and um, it is a little bit of a, a somewhat chilly spring day. And I migrated uh, from, to Tacoma from various stops in Southern California to Denver, Colorado, up in a little bit of time in the interior of Alaska before landing here. And this is where I went to law school. This is where I have developed my professional connections. And this is where I have my practice. Wonderful. Uh, I grew up in the Seattle area, as I was telling you in the green room. And when I was growing up, Tacoma didn't have like a great reputation, but 
as I got <laughs> older and I mean, there was stuff going on there, right? Not far from the airport and all that, but it is so adorable. I, I love it. I love the parks. I like kind of the funky farmer's markets and like the, the more historic homes and just, I think it's beautiful and it's a port it town. Is. So of course it's got an interesting reputation. Exactly. We have an economic engine with um, the Northwest Seaport Alliance. We have more resonant arts and museums, I think, than per capita than in any other place in the country. Western Washington History Museum, the International Museum of Class, a um, very uh, interesting uh, Carnegie uh, manuscript library, as well as the Tacoma Art Museum and a really revitalized uh, downtown and the home of a couple of artists like uh, Dale Chihuly. Mm -hmm. And it is uh, amazing. We have come a long way from maybe when you were here, when we were known for the Tacoma aroma. Yes. Uh, Very stinky. (laughs) Um, And like (laughs) I said, we have have come a long way. And now we are Grit City, where we are we embrace our grit and we embrace our art and uh, we embrace the beautiful Puget Sound and our resident pod of orcas. I love that. I love that so much. And I can, I can feel the the pride of your local area. Just, you know, just hearing you talk about it. Next time I get back to Washington state, I'd like to spend more time in Tacoma. I just think it's a really cool place. And I didn't know that about artists. So that's, that's really, really cool. Love that. Oh my gosh. Well, so I'm, I have so many questions for you. So I want to stay focused here. Let's start by tell us about your company and what you do. And if you think it's appropriate, your background and what led you to, to decide to do this. Of course. Well, to kind of go with the last part first, I think any part of someone's background really kind of leads them in a direction to open their own practice. It might be that um, a little bit of wanting more autonomy. It might be um where if you want the perfect job, I have a bias that no one else is going to create the perfection for you. This is something, it's a creative process. It's an intellectual process and there has to be something in it that pulls you into it because there are highs, there are lows, there are cycles, there is self-discovery and there are those, oh my God. God, that's another stinking learning opportunity that Mm. I got dumped in the middle of, and I didn't want another learning opportunity. Uh, But what um, I landed with is conflict management strategies, and I help organizations either prevent or address workplace conflict. That includes um, uh, people in a a variety of types of medical practices, uh, independent businesses, larger organizations. And I came to that through a circuitous route, it makes sense in the rear view mirror. And I think a lot of people who decide to go into practice for themselves, um, I don't know how many would say, I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I always wanted to be able to do this, whatever this is, because whatever your professional practice is, whatever circumstances there are in the world and in the economy, it, it, it changes. And I ended up Um, becoming interested in mediation uh, before I went to law school because I had some circumstances in my life, like most people do, where um, it was, I had asked myself, well, what should I do in this employment situation? And had I known what my rights and responsibilities were, would I have made the same choices? And these are questions I literally asked myself. And I said, well, maybe yes, maybe no. But had I known what the reciprocal rights and responsibilities were of those employers, would I have made the same decisions? Absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So I thought very, I think a little bit naively of where do you learn about rights and responsibilities? You go to law school and how do you help people make decisions and resolve conflict? And I thought, judge. Um, But then learning more about how judges actually spend their time. Um, It's less about rights and responsibilities and helping empower people and resolve workplace disputes. And it's more more about having a person make decisions within a dispute resolution system. So I was drawn to this idea of mediation where people talk about their disputes, they resolve their problems. And then, so I took mediation training and I continued to do that while I went to law school and then became still focused on the employment relationship. And that's where um, I practiced law for several years. And then after several years, I'm like, this is not what I thought it would be. I'm not really finding fulfilled. And, you know, it was a struggle. So I 
um, about 20 odd years ago, I'm like, well, what can I do? What do I want to do? And I eventually started what became conflict management strategies. Thank you for sharing that story. And I think, you know, you said we don't always start out thinking of doing, you know, X or this with the, with our eye to like, woohoo, I'm so excited to become an entrepreneur. (laughs) And I think a lot of our listeners may relate to that and that may resonate with them. Uh, Certainly when our clients come through and I use words like leader, entrepreneur, strategist, and things like that, they, they look at me like I've got three heads and I go, yeah, you know, here's the thing is we have to wear multiple hats. It's not just owner and in our case, owner provider, it's yeah. owner provider, plate spinner, strategist, fire putter outer, you know, all these different things. And so if we embrace that we're coming into a multi-faceted, multi-role situation, it's a little bit, oh, I was gonna say smoother, but it might not be smoother. Maybe there's just more of a sense of ease around it. So Yeah, maybe I find that, um, uh, so I'll go back to my thing is like nowhere in law school, was there any curriculum about learning how to run and grow a practice Mm -hmm. within that particular industry? There was an expectation of you practice law for a a, a period of time, maybe with like, you know, a firm, and then you become, you're started as an associate, become a senior associate. And then at the five-year mark, you are expected to develop a book of business, Mm -hmm. you know, essentially. And it's a little bit like an eat what you kill. You know, and even if that is, you know, help uh, with not in a plaintiff's uh, type of firm, it's still you are kind of a, that it is a business, and mm-hmm. you are expected to be accountable for your time. You're you're expected to be able to generate revenue, um, and I found that some people were really very entrepreneurial, and they're like, you know, I'm I'm not finding a job, so I'm going to strike out on my own. Um, and it might be that they never had an idea that I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but there was this idea of, well, I'm just going to open my own practice. And I think that that's a different mindset than, oh, I'm just going to strike out on my own um, and provide services on my own and construct an environment on my own. But when it comes down to it, you know, it, it, it is a business. It might be in the form of a practice, but you are still responsible for licensure and paying wages and paying taxes and looking at your accounts receivable and, you know, monitoring all of those types of things. But I don't know how many people struck out, you know, even in clinical practice of saying, well, I want to run a practice. It might be like, I want to have more independence. I want to have more control. Um, I don't want to have all of this regulation. I want to be able to practice how I want to practice, which is a little bit of a different mindset to, you know, I'm a business owner and how do I, how do I set these things up? Yeah, for sure. I think in my, I'm entering into year 13 of my practice. I have had one medical client who was entrepreneurial in their mindset and had a very good sense of anticipating the business needs and operational needs. And when I asked him, so why are you so different from the rest of my clients? Like, what is it? And he's like, so here's how I paid my way through university and my higher level training. I worked front of house in the hospitality industry and Mm. I ran a restaurant. And then I did some other things and I, then I worked in the back of the house and then I got into management and I did all these things and I learned like what it takes to make it in a very harsh industry. And so I took that with me. And when I decided to start my own practice, I thought about how we approach service, how we approach the efficiencies and inefficiencies and, and, and then, you know, when to hire the professionals to do the things that you're really not good at. Or that that don't, even if you're good at them, do not warrant your time, such as, you know, bookkeeping, payroll, things that another professional could handle and would ultimately save time, energy, and headaches. Correct. I think that's interesting. What your comment sparks to me is I'm wondering how much of um, of your listeners and those are out there just saying, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a practitioner and I'll just hire a practice manager to do that. Well, the idea is a practice manager has a certain skill set, but you know what? It's 
they're reporting to you and the staff is expecting you to be able to monitor and supervise them. So how they do their job is consistent with the mission, vision, values of how you want to run a practice and what you want the customer experience to be and what you want the internal culture to be. So um, I find that that is good. However, we can't abdicate, 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 ab, ab, abdicate. Ab, <laughs> yes, that word. Um, or Avoid. or one hundred percent delegate, and that's different. Yeah. You know, to mm-hmm. abdicate something is like I'm not, I'm not doing it's not that my right. at yeah, all. It's not, not my, my thing. Mm-hmm. Versus delegate of you be responsible for that. But even if you do delegate it, you may not be doing the day-to-day task, but it's still 100% your ultimate responsibility because your name is on the door and you, and if you are the practice and the practice is you, um, that it's, that is something that you need to be able to articulate what your values are, how you like it done, how you want people treated internally and being able to, as I say, eyes up, ears up, head on a swivel because mm-hmm. um, you're still looking around about how people are, how people are internally experiencing the practice. What are you doing? What are they struggling with? Is there conflict? Is there tension? Is there dissatisfaction? And um those are skill sets and muscles that you need to be able to exercise because even if the practice manager is a sword shield barrier liaison for you, it it is still ultimately kind of your, your responsibility to be able to work with that practice manager um, to be able to address the issues. And sometimes, you know, maybe the practice manager might have issues as well that is cascading down. And some of the issues about tension or conflict or unhappiness aren't being conveyed up to you or in some way being minimized or downplayed because it's being interpreted by the practice manager up to you. And they recognize that your time is an organizational asset. And if you're not spending time doing the clinical stuff, you're not billing for it, or they may know, they may know that's not your skill set. So- Yeah. So being able to say that, you know, if this is my practice, I own it and I'm responsible for everything inside, outside, upside down for it. What am I as a practice leader and as a provider doing to be able to make sure that I am spotting and addressing issues, even if they might, people might be minimizing them to me. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, that's also, it, it's making me think of like, okay, knowing what you do, right? That it kind of started from conflict resolution, but there must be, to use medical terms, preventative maintenance that could be, you know, implemented and completed along the way. So I'm curious, you know, do you, do your clients come to you when they're in crisis and they need support? Or do some of your clients come to you and say, you know, we've been thinking about this a lot or in one place where I used to work, this thing happened and I don't ever want to have to encounter something like that and get, you know, get, caught unexpected, unprepared for this, um, or I want to create a better environment overall, a better work environment. So do you, how do your clients come to you? The answer is yes. And, yeah. um, I, when I'm explaining what I do, I say sometimes I, cause it's, it's prevention and addressing. Mm-hmm. So on the prevention end, it might be like, Hey, um, I, I coach on conflict resolution skills and I coach up and coming leaders and I also coach um, owners. And sometimes it is uh, practice man, uh, people who own the practice will say, Hey, Carol, we want to get better at this. So why don't you come in on our half day retreats and let's talk about conflict resolution skills. And sometimes it's framed in, in how do we address concerns with clients? And then I morph it in and ask the question is, is your internal culture and branding consistent with your external culture and branding? When you say we trust, we collaborate, we value people, we highly value customer service of our people experienced in the same thing internally. And it is almost universal that people say, well, there's this kind of tension of in front of the house and back of the house Mm. piece of, you know, that the, that one department who is more in the back, maybe struggling with the, with the, with the front, with the front desk or with something else or a new, um, 
uh, maybe a new practitioner comes in and they have a very, very different way of dealing with the staff. Uh, and then that's kind of creating a little bit of friction because they have different mm-hmm. expectations of what it is. And you know, they've gone to school as well and have licensure and there's always a hierarchy. Yeah. And there's other times where it's I'm presenting at, you know, at conferences. In fact, I was just at kind of a technical conference yesterday, but there's always a side a side thing of how do we develop the soft skills? How do we develop sort of these intangible pieces that impact how people experience the job and how they experience the service? So we're kind of increasing those muscles. And then sometimes it's, we've got employees who aren't, who aren't going along well, or sometimes it's the, the tension in and among the departments is so great that we're working with the entire staff. Mm-hmm. So it's a bit of teaching. It's a bit of training. It's a bit of workshop. And it is always like, well, what end are we? Are we on the prevention to be able to upskill? And it might be that the practice is growing. We're bringing in new people. So, okay. So how do you answer the question? Who are we and how do we do things here? So that way people understand what's important and not that just we collaborate and we trust and respect, but what does that look like in practice here? Mm -hmm. And then Mm -hmm. how do you open up enough space that you don't hire someone? Oh my gosh, I see this all the time. Mm -hmm. How do you hire someone through the onboarding process and say, we're so excited to have you. We're so excited to bring you in. Um, We want to be able to learn from you. And then they're put into systems and processes and internal unspoken culture that's pretty well established. And then they want to make changes. They want to give feedback. And people are like, no, this is the way we do it here. We really like it. And it's almost setting up this dichotomy of come and join us. We're so excited to have you, but then comply. Mm-hmm. And then that and then that creates a little bit of dissonance uh, in it. So yeah, so sometimes it's so sometimes it's you know recognizing that we're going through change or that we want to be better or that we're um, or that we're looking to scale and we're concerned about how we go about doing that and what the impact might be, all of those things. So a little bit of preventative, a mm-hmm. little bit of responsive. Yeah, I think that's great. And I think, you know, uh, there's not, I feel fortunate to work with really great people. So they don't have like big dramatic staffing issues. However, because they're such great people, sometimes they lean to the side of being air quotes here too nice and not, you know, not wanting to address the issues. And I think not because they're avoidant in general, but because they don't have the skill set. So, you know, a doctor, let's say a physician or a surgeon has been trained to like deliver difficult news to a patient and they can, they know how to do that. There's a Mm -hmm. protocol for that. (laughs) It's not the same as having a difficult conversation with somebody with whom you spend, you know, six, seven, eight hours a day interacting and collaborating and working together. So I would imagine that you know, for our listeners that I think what you do and how you, how you teach and how you coach with the, the owners and the leaders and their teams could be really beneficial, like support yeah. them. To your point of um, it, it, it's a little bit cultural because we talk about, you know, maybe avoiding through the Midwest nice or, um, or not addressing the issue at all. What I find with the practices is they will say, well, the, the provider's so busy and everyone else is so busy. So it's almost like over empathy that they're deciding to live in a bit of either discomfort or pain or dissatisfaction because they don't want to burden somebody else. But then they're, it's like, that then it never gets addressed, it never gets resolved. And there and there is a little bit of dis underlying dissatisfaction and it may go to resentment. Mm-hmm. And for those organizations that really want to collaborate, it's they would say, well, you know, come and talk to me, but they may not have the time to be able to do it. Or to your point of uh, most people avoid the conversation because they don't know how the other person is going to react. And um, maybe it's like, well, that's their area but how they operate their area is kind of impacting me um, and we want, and it's not really feeling great. Mm -hmm. The other point that you bring up is the provider, you know, uh, you know, with the surgeon and stuff like that, that is designed for a reason to be an arm's length interaction. Um, And it, it, it may be an ongoing relationship, but a different caliber of ongoing relationship than with employees. And I have found that uh, not, 
not to throw anybody under the bus, but really, really, it's like how to manage and grow employees. It may be that you just have naturally built up how to be able to manage relationships and how to have difficult conversations. Um, but maybe you haven't. And maybe your professional training is to jump in and be a fixer. But depending on your position, you're going to view the problem differently. And um, also many people, because there are power dynamics at work, they may minimize, they may avoid, they may be talking to other people. And then all of a sudden you're hearing rumors of gossiping, triangulation, water cooler talk, um, and very friendly workplace organizations can be viewed as clicks by other people, which Mm -hmm. is, you know. Uh, relationships that are designed to be exclusion, exclusionary, exclu- exclusionary. So, you know, one of those things, again, like how are you as the provider, you know, developing your skills to have conversations with ongoing relationships and not just telling people what to do or, oh my gosh, I hear this so much. Like, well, they're adults, they should be able to figure it out on their own. And I always ask, well, if they, if they could figure it out on their own and given what's going on, don't you think they would have already? Yeah. And sometimes as the provider and the person who is in a leadership role, sometimes you have very different approaches, very different processes, all of which are legitimate and there needs to be a listening and then a decision making because they may never be able to reconcile this because there it's like one says black and one says white and there re- you really can't do a gray and you as the provider need to say no this is the way we do it here and i see some providers and some leaders abdicating control of saying i don't want to micromanage their adults they should figure it out but maybe the decision is such that you need to step in and say this is the way i want it done here absolutely you know i i always have a coach or a mentor that i work with and one of my biggest takeaways from a recent call was There are certain things, there are certain details that you as the founder of your company or as the owner of your practice must micromanage. You have to. It's not micromanaging the person, it's the detail. And so how do you do that? A leader doesn't have time to be sitting on top of people and like directing every little detail. You communicate clearly. There are certain things, listen, my company is a great example. There's a lot of leeway for certain things. But the way that we deliver, the way that we conduct ourselves with what we call our white glove service, that has to be done a certain way. And it has to be done the exact same way every time. (laughs) And the variations are if it's an external thing that happens. But internally, our protocols are the same for a reason, right? For consistency, for, for the application. And I think that given, like you mentioned, providers being so busy, and this is true. I hear this all the time. I'm so busy. I never have time for anything. I don't even know how to blah, 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 blah. That's something that I address with clients is how to get off of that treadmill and get into a different kind of setting. Um, That said, just the thought of like having to have that conversation to slow down, to take three steps back and lean back and do whatever can create a great sense of overwhelm. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious if when that, I'm sure it comes up, if that comes up and when it does, how do you support your clients in navigating that so they can address what really needs to be addressed and and have the company and, and practice that they dream of? Yeah. And I think of it in two different ways. I think of kind of one, the overwhelm, but the other one is that's not really my job. So Mm -hmm. if it's not really my job, I will say it. It may, it is ultimately your responsibility to be able to do that. And the kind of overwhelm, it's, I think of it in terms of, you know, you're in, you know, if you're in a healing profession, you know, in some way, shape or form, you don't want to, you want to be a catalyst to help people recover or to help people be better, to be well. So just think of it in that, in that way that you wouldn't want your staff and stuff to be in points of pain, just like you wouldn't want your clients to be in points of pain. So let's look at it this way. And then let's talk about why is this so overwhelming? Is it you don't know where to start? Is it you think that you shouldn't have to do this? Mm -hmm. Um, Is there underlying resentment that you do have to do it? 
Um, is it that you feel it's taking time away from your patients and what you really enjoy? Um, is it you feel that you've had this conversation many, many times and it's not sticking? Is it you um, just haven't seen the people do enough effort to try to resolve it on their own. So asking some of those questions and being also able to ask, what do you want out of this conversation? I mean, if you want it resolved, that's important. And for those who are looking to scale, you need to be able to, you know, set and articulate expectations. And I would I talk to people about, well, let's talk about expectations because I think some of the expectations people have are way too aspirational. And they say, we want good teamwork. We want good communication. We want good collaboration. Well, that's great. However, um, it's really very, very vague. Yeah. You need to be able to say this behavior here is symbolically significant of collaboration. This behavior here is symbolically significant of respect. This behavior in my mind is how I want collaboration to look here. This is the process I would like for you to take here. So I I think it's getting a little bit clear of we'll just figure it out. I don't want to micromanage. I want people to be autonomous. And I want to go back to that micromanage a little bit because I think it goes to the approach um, for leadership because one person's micromanaging the providers would be another person's of, please give me a framework that I can work in. Please give me a process that I can work in. Um, so that way I can feel successful because some people like process, some people like systems and they want to know what the first steps are. So for the providers out there, here's a here's a tool. Um, you, I, I go back to when I would read medical records in my uh, law practice, and the one of the standard uh, frameworks was SOAP: subjective complaints, objective complaints, analysis, and treatment plan. And we use the acronym SOAP. So when I am listening. Um, for people, I'm listening subjectively. What are they saying? How are they experiencing it? Objectively, what are they seeing and say, you know, and saying? And also, what's the impact on the practice? What's the impact on the customer service? What's the impact on the culture? Kind of how are people assessing it and the plan? What are their requests? And then for you as a practice owner, maybe just look at this like subjectively, how am I thinking about this? Because if I have some biases and some assumptions, you know, objectively, what's actually Actually going on? What's my assessment as the leader of the practice or the person who, who others think is ultimately responsible? And then kind of what's the plan? And um, being able to then not just have people talk about it, but let's say, okay, let's talk about it. And now what are we going to do about it? How are we going to kick it to action? What are people's individual responsibilities? And what is my responsibility for checking in and holding myself and other people accountable to see small improvements for the relationship and for the practice? That's so helpful to break it down that way. Um, I think, you know, something that really stood out to me is like, we'll say, we'll give the broad strokes. Oh, we want to be a collaborative team. That's really nice. What does that mean? Yeah. That, like when you said yeah. that, I was like, yeah, you know, like, good for you. Yeah. What does being, that look like? <laughs> being like my 17 year old and rolling my eyes very hard and saying, you know, Hmm, well, but what does that really mean? And I've learned mm-hmm. something even within, I mean, we're a very small organization in my, in my business, but having a conversation with my director of operations and saying, So I've never asked you some of the questions that I would ask like a prospective client. And I feel like I'm missing some of the nuances and how I could communicate better with you. Every Mm -hmm. time there's a communication glitch, guess who, (laughs) guess who's the one who notices, you know, where it stems. And I'm pointing at myself for people who cannot see this. So I learned so much by asking some of those questions, like, what do you want out of, like, out of this kind of conversation or about, out of our arrangement? What are the things that give you angst that you're afraid to ask me about? (laughs) 
Um, and something you said in our intake form really, really struck me. And I wanted to tie into this is you're not as accessible as you think you are. That was, it felt a little bit like a gut punch and it's, it's giving me pause and, and you've already given me something to think about and something to focus on as a leader within my organization. But can you tell us a little bit more about that and maybe give us some direction, how to be more accessible? There are so a couple of different points that I have very often seen, well, I have an open door policy, come and talk to me with any problems and questions. But again, there are power dynamics in workplaces and it is a lot of courage and a lot of trepidation and a lot of overwhelm to go and talk to someone who is in a higher position of authority saying, I have concerns, I have a problem. The other thing is if the practice is busy, people don't want to burden you. You know, they, they want, they, they know that they don't want to bother you or the uh, the terrible thing is if they've done it before and they haven't seen any changes they're like well he, they're not going to do anything about it mm-hmm. and that undermines their confidence in your competence as a leader so when we say like well i've always got an open door i'm available to you reach out really the door is open for you to go out and have those conversations and invite and invite Um, feedback. And also know that you will make the invitation many times, maybe dozens of times uh, before someone takes you up on it. And they are looking around to see how you follow through with others. They're looking for social proof that you actually follow through with, um, with meeting for people and that you have the time and the space to, and the mental space to be able to address. So perhaps you have, you know, if you're able to have, you know, one-on-one meetings or go into department meetings and prompt um, people like, you know, what is it maybe use like those kind of stay interview questions of, you know, are we fully utilizing you? Is, is this work environment what you expected to you? Are there ways that we can we can live up to our brand a little bit better? Um, and many times people have never had those conversations and might freak out a little bit because they might assume that you're gonna about to fire them because if they're like, oh, how is this working out for you? Yeah, you know, it's usually like an exit interview. <laughs> a bad conversation. So yeah. But being able to be really kind of consistent and thoughtful, and if you could even just say, wow, that's really interesting, or you make a good point, or, you know, I haven't thought about it that way before, are very response or responses to say that you are opening to listening to what's happening. And, and people want to see that you have thoughtfully considered their input in making decisions. So when you have team meetings or team lunches, or maybe you have pharmaceutical reps or other reps come in and bring lunch um, to be able to do, to do things. Or maybe you close down for a little, a little bit when you gather people purposefully together, or you have in, um, in services for, you know, what, whatever, whatever reason, taking micro moments to be able to ask those questions and ask it repeatedly because trust builds over time. And you may ask it a million different times and if, and get people thinking about it. And just maybe, you know, when, when you say, Hey, I'm, you know, kind of curious about these types of questions. And also what kind of questions do you have for me about the practice? Um, So that way it's more of a dialogue of I'm here to ask questions. I'm also here to answer questions. I think that's helpful uh, because if people have to go through teams or Slack or get on your calendar or or catch you in between patients, it's like all of a sudden you're you're not there. Mm -hmm. Um, Really, you know, you're not there. And I think also the positional power, the reality of, um, fear of retaliation or getting on someone's bad side or viewed as like, well, they're complaining and they're a favorite. And so the provider is going to listen to them more than, you know, that pe- people are, are concerned about those things. And you may say that doesn't happen here. I will say, really, mm-hmm. so it's <laughs> not even possible that that could, could happen. And the longer you have relationships with people, the more um, people may be reluctant because they don't want to tip. um, They don't want to create a mess. Yeah. Because they don't want to have to deal with what maybe the coworkers have to say. Mm, So good. Such good tips. Um, So much to to take home. Um, Before we wrap up, I have 
to, I might have three questions, but they're really quick. Um, okay. the, <laughs> the, you've kind of just done this, but do you have, you know, your biggest piece of advice that you give out or the one that you think is the most impactful for people in their leadership and communication? Um, that how you view micromanaging or how you view conflict or what your idiosyncratic definition of what a good leader is may be very different than the type of leader that your people need. And if you ask people, well, how can I be better for you? That's good. However, how people say they want to be managed may be different than how they need to be managed. And um, being able to reflect back, how am I leading based on my biases? Um, How is that creating the culture and the climate? of people that if we say we really want autonomy um, and we want you to be you know, independent and figure it out on your own, they may be making decisions independently that may be inconsistent with the brand that values their autonomy, but gives a consistently inconsistent approach across the practice. Mm. This is why it's good to have things in writing. <laughs> <laughs> True. Sure. And some lawyer, people may can. view it as a ground rule, a black and white, and other people may view it as a guideline mm-hmm. to be negotiated and flex based on the needs of the practice. So as a leader, you need to be very clear of when a ground rule, a non-negotiable is a non-negotiable and when it may be up for negotiation because you or others in their leadership may be making, um, uh, maybe calling audibles that for other people are setting role model precedents of that's, well, they, they varied from that guideline or that ground rule earlier. So therefore there's, um, I have implicit permission to do that and you may mm-hmm. not, or there may be different reasons why they needed to flex. Um, so. Yeah. Really, really good stuff. Well, where can people find you to, uh, to inquire or to learn more about what you, what you do and how you support businesses and practices? Well, a great way is the website managingconflict.com. And I'm also on most of the social media, including LinkedIn, where several years ago, someone identified me as one of the top 30 people to follow for conflict resolution on LinkedIn. And um, if you're so inclined, if you go to the website, managingconflict.com, there's an opportunity there to click on a conflict tip of the day, a curated tip, trick, technique, video, article link, where I provide um, little resources for people to increase their conflict resolution muscles. And I find a lot of managers and practice managers will take that and forward it and share it around their team. And it is a very safe way to be able to introduce um, conversations or questions to talking about our team and who we are. And if we need to have conversations, how we can go about doing that. Wonderful. We will make sure all of that is linked in the show notes to make it really easy for our listeners to find it. And just a final question. Is there anything that I did not ask you or something that you really wanted to tell us? Um, I think that conflict resolution skills, whether that's um, where we want to call it um, creating psychological safety or emotional intelligence or collaboration or problem solving or negotiation, those are all life skills. And you have to, like most skill sets, you have to learn them, you have to practice them. And if you can practice them, obviously, tenaciously, deliberately with people, it can become a superpower. And that's a superpower that can change people's lives, particularly when we spend so much time and effort and life energy at work. And can you imagine if more people are doing that, what kind of amazing cultures um, and what kind of amazing communities we can create and that can really change the world. So yes, it might be challenging to be able to do it. And the more that you practice it, the more Um, it's maybe not easier, but maybe less difficult to be able to have those conversations. Mm. Carol, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Y'all, I enjoyed this conversation so much that I started to lose track of time. (laughs) I could listen to and learn from Carol all day. I hope that you found this discussion about workplace conflict management and culture valuable. And at the very least, it's given you something to think about as you navigate building a successful harmonious practice. Remember, conflict is inevitable. Where there are people, 
there is conflict, but it doesn't have to be damaging. By understanding the sources of conflict, becoming an active listener, and employing effective communication techniques, you can transform a challenge into an opportunity and learning experience. And as you know, when we're learning, we're growing. I invite you to take what you've learned today and apply it to your own practice. Be sure to sign up for the conflict tip of the day at Carol's website. Links in the show notes. As always, thank you for listening. See you in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Thriving Practice. I appreciate you. And I have an ask. If you got value from this show, make sure to share it. You can give a shout out on social media or tell your friends and colleagues about it. You can also subscribe so you never miss a show. To learn more about how we work with practice owners to help them take back their time, head over to tracytrupeski.com. While you're there, sign up for our newsletter, which has tips and tools for your practice success. A special thanks to our incredible team and thanks to you, our dear listener, for sharing the gift of your time and attention. I wish you so much success as you continue to move forward in your day. If I can be a resource to you, let's schedule a time to talk. You can find the scheduling link on our website.